Greetings, saints of God. Greetings. Today was very exhausting for me. I just walked in just in time to deliver this message for you. Very exhausting getting here, and I am very refreshed just at the sight of all of you right now. Instantly, I am feeling relieved. I am feeling less stressed. I feel the joy just inside just seeing you all out here right now. So that, gives, that indeed gives me the peace I need to minister unto you today. Now, this uh, passage we're looking at, that we're splitting, it's Hebrews 10, verse 10. And we're going to be talking about like what you are in Christ Jesus. That's something we also, we, that's something we need to keep in mind. That's something, we'll look, what does Jesus say about his people? What does God say about those whom he has saved? That's the things we're going to go over, but they're not going to just limit it to that. We're going to look at why we're that way. How did God bring us to the state that we're in now? I only have three words. The whole text, Hebrews 10, 10, it says, We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That we are sanctified. That's going to be my part of the message. We are sanctified. Three words. This is considering what Jesus has done for us. Sanctified, that's not something I've done. That's something Christ has done for me. That's something he's made me. And it amazes me how little is being said concerning what, who people are in Christ Jesus. What's their identity? It amazes me. As believers, we must keep in mind how God views us now that we're saved. And knowing what he says about you, now that you're his child, that builds an amazing amount of joy and confidence. That, that's what kind of gives you the strength to boldly come before that throne of grace. Knowing that you're accepted, knowing that you're received, knowing that you've had a change from status from damned to saved. That's something that always brings joy. And it's my aim to show you today what the Lord said about you. This isn't just like kind of an intellectual discourse. What's God say about those whom he serves? It's talking about you. Amen. You, the children of God, the elect of God. Amen. And you will certainly find as I go over this, you're not going to be spoken of the same way that you were before you were saved. In your original, when you were in your original state, you're going to see there was definitely a transition just by the way he speaks to you. Now that being said, allow me to take a moment to just kind of refute some claims concerning this because there are some things that are said in our day that are corrupt that lead the wrong impression. Now, when I read the words, we are sanctified, when I just read those words, I'm instantly finding myself wondering how these few words can fit with a lot of things being preached today. If you listen to the way people represent the church, the elect of God, you would think that they're no different than anyone else at all. You, really, you'll have to listen now. You, I mean, if you haven't heard, I mean, just turn on the radio, TV, someone's saying it somewhere about the people of God that they are not what the word of God says that they are. Maybe you've heard it that we're not really righteous or holy, but God treats us that way. Perhaps you've heard this. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty popular doctrine around here. I've heard it almost every day on the radio. You're treated as though you're righteous. And when subjects like righteousness, holiness, purification, great, great uh, affirmations like this, they may quote to you something like John 8, 7. Well, who he was without sin, let him cast the first stone. You're just as bad as me. Or maybe they'll quote... Romans 3.23, oh, wait a minute. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're no different at all. Or maybe they'll say 1 John 1, 1.8, well, if any man say he's without sin or he has no sin, then he deceives himself and he's a liar. Truth's not in him. There you have it. You're the same as everyone else. And for some reason, people, when they quote these passages, they think they're saying that we're no different. But nothing could be further from the truth. They may say, like, well, we're, sin we're like everybody else, but the only difference is we're forgiven. That's not a proper approach. That is not a scriptural affirmation. That's not from the word of God. That is the philosophy of men. Now, whatever we're like everyone else means, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess in one sense you could build a case on that. I mean, yeah, we are somewhat the same as everyone else in the sense that we have like two eyes, fingers and toes, belly buttons. I guess in that sense you could build a case, but this is not what people mean. You have to pardon my sarcasm there, but when considered children of God, they are different than those who are condemned. There is a real difference. Now, do the scriptures say that those who do righteousness are treated like they're righteous, as he's righteous? Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. It says they who do righteousness are righteous. Are righteous. 1 John 3, 7. Does it say that those who shall inherit the kingdom of God are still unrighteous and they're merely treated as though they're washed and sanctified and justified? Or that they were unrighteous and now washed, sanctified, and justified. I'm actually going to read that to you. 
This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Were, past tense. That's not how God looks at you now. Well, how does he look at you? It's said in the next statements here. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. See, that's how God views you now. Let's bring another one up. Does it say that we're still dead in sins and we're treated as though we're quickened? Does it say that? No, no. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but he's quickened us together in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are quickened. The living people, alive, is one raised from the dead. And also you may recall a text where it says that you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Amen. Walk as children of light. See, a, living, a changed people can react act on words like that. Walk as children of light. You can't say that to those in darkness. They're not in the light. So I think you're getting my point here. God has changed you. He really has. It's real. It's, real. it's right there in the scriptures. And don't let anyone convince you that this is not true. Now, this very manner of thinking, this kind of like focusing on like who we are in the flesh, this is kind of an old covenant way of thinking if you think of it. And if you observe the main passage here, still here in Hebrews 10, you'll notice that it starts off by saying in verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified. Now, what's that talking about? In verse 9, it says, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, speaking of Jesus, O God, he taketh away the first thing, he establish the second. This is the taking away of the first covenant, the old covenant, and the establishment of the second covenant. And that was established by Jesus Christ. And it says, by the which will, that's speaking of that new covenant. Under this covenant, you're sanctified. Under that one, you weren't. However, just look a few verses before. Let's see, verses 6 and 8. It says, In burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin thou hast no pleasure. And also in verse 8, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering of sin thou would not, neither hast there pleasure in any therein which are offered by the law. So it's clearly under the old covenant. God didn't have pleasure in those sacrifices. They didn't take away sins. They didn't, they didn't remove the sin from the people or change them. In fact, it brought remembrance of sin. That's what it did. That's the effect. It was like a, discourage, a very discouraging result. Still a sinner, still unchanged. And those sacrifices were only like a type and shadow of what was to come. But I can't, So people were kind of left on, I'm still a sinner. After the sacrifice is offered, I'm still a sinner. Not good enough. And I feel there's a lot of people who feel this way in our day after hearing some of the things that are preached. I'm still not good enough. I'm not changed. See, that's old covenant. This is the new covenant. This is the new covenant. And change that we have experienced in Christ Jesus is proof that we are under that covenant. Now I'm going to look, just get, kind of get right into this. Like, we are sanctified. I'm going to share a few other versions on that. So, just to show, like, how big of a statement this is. One of the versions says, we have been made holy. That's how one put it. One says, we are set free from sin. Set apart as holy. Purified from sin. Made fit for God. And then one of the really early ones that says we are hallowed, which is like sacred, set apart for a sacred use. So you can see none of these versions appear to be speaking of something that hasn't actually taken place. But rather it's, some, it's not something we're pretending to be. This is what we are. This is real. Very real affirmation. The main thing to see here is we're reading about something God does. We're sanctified. Now instantly we're addressed to something God did to you, not something I did to myself. Now, there is, in a sense, a sanctification, I suppose, that we accomplish. And I suppose you could back that up with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 3 and 4. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, and that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay, so there's a sense where you can, there's a sanctification you accomplish. And there's a sense where we cleanse ourselves. That's 2 Corinthians 7, 1. But this is not what's being talked about here. What's being spoken about here is God setting his people apart through the offering of Jesus Christ. It is about him placing them in the realm of blessing and divine favor. That's what's being declared here. The use of the word sanctified here, if you think about it, it's, it's in a much more broader sense than it's normally used. 
And usually when you read about sanctification, you think about like the remission of sins, the process of being regenerated, the, this, uh, the work that God's doing, the conformity into the image of Christ. You kind of have that, and that is involved here. But in this sense, it does involve being made holy, but it also involves like consecration, which is being separated from a common to a sacred use, dedicated and devoted to the service and worship of God, and being set apart. It also involves everything that makes us holy or works on our behalf to make us holy. You might think of things like cleansing, forgiveness, justification, reconciliation, regeneration. All of these realities are, right here you can see, contained in that term, we are sanctified. It's, saying, it's like kind of like showing all of this just in that small phrase there. And it's a reality here to be embraced by all believers. Nothing wavering now. The fact is God has chosen a people for himself, and it is his purpose to have them dwell where he is. That is the will of God, brethren. But in order for us to enter that kingdom, he has to deal with those sins. No one's going to enter in the kingdom of heaven, stained, defiled, and dead. And it's not an easy or simplistic work that the Lord is doing. It's taken the whole history of the world to accomplish it. So as we begin, I want to show how the Lord is working out his purpose, and how the thing being spoken of here was part of God's will from the very foundation of the world, brethren. I do this to increase, that's the purpose I'm doing here. I'm going to, I'm going to help increase your confidence and what the Lord's doing in you. Now, what I'm going to bring here is to show that you're a chosen people. Now, um, it's good to remind the people that they're God's elect. It's a very good thing to remind. Remember how the scriptures talk about you're a chosen generation? Doesn't that have a good sound to it? You? Not talking to those people over there. It's talking to me. The people I'm sitting with around me, you're a chosen generation. Remember when Paul wrote to the Romans, he asked, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, his chosen people? And when Paul wrote to the Colossians, he told them to put on several things, as the elect of God. And to apply more to our main passage, I want to bring you remembrance the words of the Apostle Peter, who described the saints as elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Another passage that ties in well with this is one of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians saying, God has from the beginning chosen you. See, there's that word, you, to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. One more to show that the sanctification is something that has to do with something God has purpose. It's something found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He says, he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That, this is the, this is the reason now, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And in case you didn't catch like kind of the meaning of that particular passage, the Spirit's not saying that God made a decision that holy and blameless people would be accepted in his kingdom. That's not what he said there. Neither does it say that he chose us because he knew we would be blameless and holy. That's not what he said. But rather, it's saying that he chose us for the purpose of being holy and blameless. To be more precise, us being holy and blameless is a result of God's choice, not our own choice. To say other words, it would be like salvation by works. It would be pretty much the same as embracing that if you were to say otherwise. But that's, look, I bring this up just to show. The reason you're saved today, the reason you believe, the reason you can see what you see, it's because God has purpose to save you. It was part of God's, God's good will to save you. It was part of his purpose. Your salvation was not an accident. It was not coincidence. It was something God made happen. It was part of his objective. And it brings, it brings to my heart the abundance of joy and satisfaction to know that I'm part of a people chosen by God. And I hope it has that same effect on you. Now, those who are sanctified, the main, the main thing you just want to like see right off the bat, this is a state of acceptance. Sanctified. The people of God. God looks at them. He's not angry. His wrath doesn't abide on them. He doesn't tell them, depart from me. He doesn't say that to these people. He says, come to me, abide with me. That's what he says to the people who are sanctified. Now, allow me to show you what the word of God says concerning people mentioned in the main passage. Those who are sanctified, those who have received the remission of sins and forgiveness. Those who are sanctified, you, I guess, could easily be described as Christ's sheep. In Matthew 25, when reading of the coming judgment day, the people that are welcomed into the kingdom are called the sheep. But those who are condemned are called the goats. Those who are 
with that in mind, I can see how Christ talks about his sheep. He's talking about those who are sanctified. Those whom he's worked in, that's who the people who are sanctified are. It is said of Christ's sheep that they are known by him, that they follow him, they're given eternal life. They never perish. No outside force can forcibly remove them from Christ or God's hand, that they know the shepherd's voice, that's Christ, and they will not follow the voice of a stranger. That's how you are described in the scripture. As, a, as the people of God, when reading passages like this, you say, that's a description of me. It's talking about me. Now, if, I ask, if you ask me, that sounds like a description of the people in Hebrews 10, verse 10, what I just read to you there. Showing that this verse accents the acceptable state when a person is brought into the realm of blessing. We are told that nothing separates us from the love of God. We're told that we have a hope that does not disappoint. That's said to us. We're told that we have peace with God. That we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in high places in Christ. We're told that we're predestined to be conformed to the Im image of his dear son. Predestined to the adoption of sons. All things work together for our good. We're delivered from this present evil world. Amen. That's stuff that's said about the sanctified. All these passages, they kind of like show you something about that term. Those who are sanctified, these are all things that tell you about that. And now that you're in this state, you're made a new creature. New creature, you're not the same. You're made, God, has, God has put life in you. So you're now a living thing. Sin is not imputed to you. How about that? How about you've received the gift of God or the eternal life? You have a place being prepared for you. Now you have an eternal inheritance and your name is written in the book of life. This is the state you are in as a result of the sacrifice of Christ. A state of blessing, a state of acceptance, a state of happiness. A state of peace. I say praise God for this marvelous work that he's wrought in us. That's something to get excited about. Now, why are we accepted exactly? See, I mean, we've seen all these benefits we have, but why is that the case? Why is God just pouring out such an abundance of blessing on us? Why does he speak about us so favorably? Why does he love us so? And embrace us and call us into his kingdom. And call us his children. It is important to know why this is the case. Again, we're forced to reconsider to uh, reconsider this doctrine that believers are no different than unbelievers. That, again, just comes to the ground because there is a difference. The thing I want to show here is there, a real change has taken place in those whom the Lord has given life and peace. Very real. The main thing that comes to mind is like the new creation, like I just mentioned. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he who is in Christ, he's a new creature. New creature. Now, not he's going to be. Not in due time he will be. He is the moment he comes in. He's a new creature. Or a new creation, it says in New King James. That part of us that's born of God. What does that say? 1 John 3, 9. He that, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For sin, seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. For he's born of God. That's, what I'm talk, that's the part I'm talking about right now. Those who are sanctified are those who have received this change through Christ. They've been buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. They've been quickened from a state of deadness. They were darkness, but now they're light in the Lord, and they walk as children of light. They were without Christ, but now they're near Christ. They were the children of disobedience and wrath, but now they are the children of the day and the children of promise. A wonderful transition took place when you took hold of the truth by faith. Amen. You were not the same. You're a new creature, and you are being made fit for the glorious world to come. You, are, you have a new heart. Isn't that something that's prophesied in Ezekiel? It's a new heart and a new spirit I'll give them. That's talking about you. It's talking about you. Even back in those early times in the Old Testament, God was talking about his people. He had you in mind when he said this. this uh, it's a heart that loves the Lord more than anything else. It's a heart that has its affection set on things above. It's not a stony heart anymore, but it's a heart of flesh. That's what God has done. New spirit within you as well, and you've been given the mind of Christ also. And it is with provisions such as these that we can act on commands like sin no more. See, the new creation can act on those words. Sanctified people act on those words. But I can't do it, Lord. No, that's the flesh. The spirit says, yes, I can. Or flee youthful lusts. You can do that now. Or don't set your affection on things of the earth. That, too, is something that you have been given resource to do. How about love not the world? Oh, the new creation has no trouble with that command. 
It hates the world. It wants, it, doesn't, it wants to leave. Earnestly desire to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Or don't walk as fools. Don't walk as fools. Don't walk like the simpleton. Be wise. Walk circumspectly. See, God's given you a nature that can act upon what he commands now. Sanctified. Uh, it's also in Titus 2, 14, you are described this way. Speaking of Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself, remember, he's talking about you, a peculiar people zealous of good works. What kind of works? Works of righteousness, works of God. That's what we're zealous for. And this shows the flip side of the coin. Because what comes with being sanctified is not just the power to not do what is wrong, even though you know, we do have that power. We can say no to sin. The temptation comes and cast down every imagination. We can resist the devil and he will flee from us. We had that. But it comes with the power to do what is right. That also, we can't forget that. So, when God says, be holy as I am holy. Well, see, now you can act. Now, now you can do it. Because he's given you those resources. If Christ says, abide in me. Stay with me. Remain with me. Now you can because that's what the sanctified have the ability to do. It's like, it's a unique ability given to those who are saved. I give thanks that I can act upon the things that the Lord commands me to do. I give thanks that when the Lord tells me to do something, that I don't have to constantly fail and fall short. But I can accomplish what he gives me to do. And it's by his grace that I can do it. But the thing I'm wanting to show here, really accent here, is that anything in our hearts that's holy, like that new heart, that new spirit, or maybe even the new mind, the desire to do what is right, the desire to be with God, anything like that, or any influences that make us holy are all traced back to Christ in some way. <coughs> when considering new heart and spirit, that's traced back to Jesus. And that's where you got it. When considering being justified before God, that's traced back to Jesus. <coughs> when considering reconciliation, traced back to Jesus sanctification, regeneration, all of these things have Jesus as the root, as the foundation. That's where it all be. Ain't, no matter what you think of, like various ways you've been saved, you're going to end up with Jesus as the foundation of that thing. And what, how, however, in this text, we're not, we are not just tracing these wonderful things to Jesus, but to a specific thing Jesus did. You notice that in the passage? We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. That's a specific deed by Christ that all these things right here that we've gone on to are traced back to. We're going to be reminded salvation is of the Lord. That we are, what we are what we are by the grace of God. That's what we're going to see now as we look back to see like how all this started. Where did it all come from? How is it that we obtain this change? Why are we able to partake of these amazing gifts from God? How is it we've been forgiven and cleansed from our sins? How do we make the transition from enemy to dear child? All of these questions are answered in the latter part of the main passage. It's through that offering of the body of Christ. Amen. We'll now see these things opened up to us.